Chapter 4. War. I hate war, but when I was little, I loved it. War was a game. Guns were toys, death and amusement ride. The first card game I ever played was called War. I also played with little green soldiers, maybe two inches high. I loved their perfect, tiny helmets that reminded me of cereal bowls. Even the faces of the soldiers were perfect and green. Their tiny mouths and eyes were forever locked into a battlefield moment that I could only imagine. I read G.I. Joe and Combat Kelly comic books. Then, down at the creek, I would poke a stick into the powdery bottom silt, pop it upward, and go BOOM! I pretended the resulting brown underwater cloud was an atomic bomb explosion. And, of course, I played war with my friends. Beyond the dead end, there were two major arsenals, the stone pile and the spear field. The stone piles were on the other side of the tracks, between the main dump and the creek. There were five of them, each about ten feet high. The piles no doubt belonged to a construction company, but as far as we dead-end kids were concerned, they were there strictly in answer to our instinct to fling a stone. Yet the one real stone battle I can recall happened not there, but at the creek, another inexhaustible story, a source of stones. It wasn't called Stony Creek for nothing. We divided ourselves into two platoons and took up positions on either side of the creek. We loaded up and fired away. The creek at that point was hardly wider than an alleyway. Across the water, Johnny Seaton was firing from behind a tree. I waited till he poked his head out. He was looking right at me. I fired. I was aiming to hit him in the eyebrow. This is not as malicious as it sounds, for we were only playing at war. We were pretending, and everybody knew you didn't get hurt pretending. Besides, Johnny Seaton was one of my two best friends, and double besides. Who ever actually hit what they were aiming at? The stone hit him in the eyebrow. He screamed. He wouldn't stop screaming. Blood streamed down his face. He galloped across the water, ignoring stepping stones, screamed up the creek bank, and screamed all the way home. As for me, pretend did not give way to horror instantly. For several seconds of fanciful confusion, as Johnny Seaton thrashed wildly past me, I felt surprised that our relationship as best friends did not seem to count in this matter, as if a stone thrown by me could or should hurt him less. Neither Johnny nor his parents ever said anything to me about the incident. They didn't have to. The two-week patch on Johnny's eye punished me every day. Spears were safer. Go to the dead end, turn left, walk up past the walk up the tracks, past Red Hill, and the other, smaller dump, climb the trackside bluff, and you were in the spear field, so named for the plants growing there. Strip one of them of its leaves, and you were left with a sturdy, four-foot-high stalk, straight as a pool cue. Plug it from the ground, shake off the root dirt, and bring on the enemy. As I passed through the grade school years, war became less about machine gun chatter and spectacular explosions, and more about people. I read about war about the bodies of soldiers, even enemy soldiers, whose lifeless hands clutch photographs of loved ones back home. I read the torture of captive troops. I especially cringed over the fingernail torture, in which a pair of pliers pulled out the victim's fingernails, slowly, one by one. Such things happened to spies and to people who knew too many secrets. I resolved that if I was ever in a war, I would be a dumb non-spy. But... I could not resolve not to be a soldier. Every passing day, every February 1st, the date of my birth, prodded me closer to the ominous cloud that hung over my future. It was called the draft, and it meant that when I, and all other boys deemed healthy enough, got out of high school or college, I would have to join the armed forces, whether I wanted to or not. As if to prepare me, my daydreams placed me in grim wartime situations. I saw myself apparently a failure at avoiding secrets, in the hands of enemy interrogators. Tell us, they growl. Never, I say firmly, for I am a good American soldier. Then I feel the pliers grip the end of the nail on my right index finger, and cold sweat pours from me, and I feel the tug of the pliers, and then the pain begins, and I sing. I sing like the Vienna Boys Choir. I empty my head like a box of cornflakes. I tell them everything, from our deepest military secrets to my shoe size. And I anguish. Because though I realize this is only a daydream, I am afraid that if such a thing ever really happens, I will play my part poorly. I am afraid that I will crack during torture. I am ashamed that I cannot measure up to a captive spy I once read about, 
whose lips were still sealed after losing all ten fingernails. Sometimes, in my fearful fantasies, my captors bypass torture and simply march me out to the firing squad. But I never got shot. Even as six rifle sights met at my trembling heart, Ready? Aim? I call out to the commanding officer. Wait a minute! The commanding officer pauses. There is something you don't know. If you shoot me, you'll never find out. The officer calls off the guns. He expects me to divulge vital military secrets. But the information I offer is purely personal. I tell him something about his wife, his family back home, something he could never have known without me. He's overcome with gratitude. He dismisses the firing squad, and I have discovered something. Words can save me. Despite all the attention I paid to warfare, I was never in a real fight. Around sixth grade, this began to bother me. I saw other kids flailing and clubbing, tearing each other's shirts to shreds, trading bloody noses, and I said to myself, Hey, why not me? I began to feel deprived because my right hand had never known the feel of fist on chin. I felt a growing need to hit somebody. But who? I could think of no one I wanted to hit, and apparently nobody wanted to hit me. Every day I walked to and from school unchallenged. I was a burr in no one's saddle, a likable bloke. However, the prospect of going through life punchless was too strong to ignore. I looked around my classroom. Who was as small as I? Or better yet, even smaller. Who was unlikely to hit me back? Who needed hitting? There was only one answer. Joey Stackhouse. Joey Stackhouse was skinny. Mashed down his blonde pompadour, and he was maybe half an inch shorter than I. He had a narrow, foxy face, but his main feature was his teeth. He was a walking warning against not brushing. When he smiled, you found yourself looking at all the colors in your crayon box. Plus, his clothes were shabby. For several days, I hung close to Joey, alert for an offending remark or gesture. He remained obstinately harmless as friendly as ever. It became clear that I myself would have to manu manufacture the momentum for the punch. I worked myself into a snit. I convinced myself that anybody with teeth like that was asking for it. One day, he walked home with me after school. We were on the 700 block of George Street, close to my house. I picked a fight with him, accused him of something. I don't remember what. Then, I hit him. I balled my fist and swung, and when my knuckles landed, fuck! Against his chin bone, I was as surprised as when my stone hit Johnny Seaton. As punches go, it was dainty. More tap than wallop, my intention being to match a punch's form, not force. I'm sure that physically he barely felt it, but a punch has a double impact, as I was about to learn, and only the first lands on the chin. Joey's eyes widened. He stood there staring at me with such wild astonishment that I knew at once he had not, not in a million years, been asking for it. He started to cry. He blurted out, Why did you do that? And ran back down George Street. If I ever had notions of becoming a warrior, they died that day as I turned the other way and walked home alone. It has been more than forty years since I hit Joey Stackhouse, the first and last person I ever punched and it remains the only taste of war I ever needed. That ends chapter four. Please look over your questions and go back into the text to answer them before moving on to the next chapter.